All right, let's go with the acid flow. And of course, this was parsing. What could possibly go wrong? Well, we started by saying that the attacker controlled input of A1 was what you were going to look at. So A1 goes ahead and taints V4, V4 taints V9, and V9 is ultimately passed into XML get next tag name. So if we were looking at something like this string in XML that was being parsed, A1 might have started here and V9 would start in the same location. Also, V11 is going to be a hard-coded sized 136 byte buffer on the stack. All right, so we call into IMSPL, XML get next tag name, attacker controlled source is being assigned to pointer. Now, the original pseudocode that the researchers provided didn't, you know, provide the full details, but that's okay. Basically, they're saying that, you know, this is going to skip space characters. It's going to find the beginning mark, the less than sign, and skip any comments that may be embedded therein. So, if pointer starts out here and source starts out here, it's going to find this less than sign. And then pointer plus one is going to be V8 and V8 is going to be V13 of zero. So both V8 and V13 of zero point at this first actual character of the tag itself. Then V13 is passed into find tag end. All right, so now the status looks like this. So this was V13, now it's result. It's the character pointer pointer. And so result when dereferenced points at this actual F right there. So Result dereferenced goes into I. I is going to be still a pointer that points there. And now we are going to dereference I itself, and that's going to be the current char character. It caused me to say chair. Char. It's a char. It's not a chair. It's not a car. It's a char. Anyways, current character is F. All right. So now we're inside of a for loop here. And we're looking at the current character and we're saying if that value is less than D, so now it's kind of assuming, you know, ASCII values and stuff like that. If it's less than D, then it's going to shift it, shift the number one by, you know, whatever the value is. And it's going to end that with some bits. So these are going to be multiple bits that would be set if this was a carriage return, a new line, a tab, or a null character. So null character, because if this was zero, then it would shift one by zero and you just get one. All right, well, that's one way to get out of the loop. And then if it doesn't get out of the loop that way, then current character minus 32, just to manipulate the value, bring it down. And then V2, checking if it's less than 1F. Again, this is just all about ASCII character evaluation. Basically, it's just a more complicated way than checking if this or this or this or this or this or this or this, right? So V2, and then we've got just some unknown known memory value. It doesn't really matter because the comment is telling us that this is going to be checking whether or not it's a space, a slash, a greater than symbol, or a question mark. Other ways to break out of this loop. So the net result of that is if we don't break out of the loop, which we won't on the first try because it was F and it doesn't hit on any of those, then we move I forward. So we've got I++. plus plus. And so now I points here and current character is updated to O. And again, O doesn't hit on any of those special exit conditions. So we move forward, current character is still equal to O. And then we move forward one more time. And now the current character is space. And we see that space is one of the things that was being searched for. So it's going to go ahead and hit on this break condition there. And then result is going to be set to I. And consequently, it's going to move forward like this. And result, it will be what is returned. Now, the thing about this is that these are acid exit conditions. And this is effectively an unbounded loop because it's just going to keep moving forward until it finds one of these exit conditions. So that should perhaps cause your spoily sense to tingle because you've got an unbounded loop with acid exit conditions but there is no actual manual mem copy within the context of this loop. So this isn't exactly one of those common cases we're looking for. Well, it goes ahead and it returns out of this. And so now V13 of zero, which had been pointing at the same place as V8 at the F, now upon return, it's pointing at that last character. All right, so V13 of zero set to V9. So V9 now also points there. And then we do a check if V8 not equal to V13, well, V8's back here, V13's up here. 
it's not equal so we go ahead and get in here and now we're up to a mem copy if and, and the length is going to be v13 of 0 which is the pointer to this so it's doing pointer subtraction this address minus v8 that address and so that should be three characters right if that was a 0 1 2 3 then it would be you know something ending in 3 minus something ending in 0 and you'd get a three character value where does it copy from? It copies from pointer plus one, so that's effectively the same as V8. So it's copying from the F of that foo tag, and it's copying it into dest. Dest is that hard-coded 136-byte buffer on the stack. Well, that should cause your exploity sense to tingle because you've got an attacker-controlled size, right? Because this displacement of this size, you know, this, this calculation of this size was ultimately under the attacker's control they set the value that was used in the XML, and therefore they set how far forward this would have been, this v13 of zero, by the time that it comes out of this find tag end, and therefore it's a fully attacker-controlled size. It's also an attacker-controlled data because that data is what the size was being calculated for. So this is not safe. This is our traditional sweet potato case of a weakly bounded thing like a mem copy being used to buffer overflow. All right, so again, that destination was only 136 bytes. So if instead of something that looked like this with a foo that's only three characters long, we got a foo that was greater than 136 characters long, then ultimately this mem copy that's gonna go on inside of there would overflow this 136 byte buffer. So there's their proof of concept and there's your classic acid burn with all A's. And if we go back and we look at our root causes for a second, I want to dwell upon this notion of wrapper functions, right? So the actual vulnerability was due to a mem copy, but if we go back and we look at this get next tag name, we can see that it's got a source and it's got a destination and it's assuming, you know, essentially what is a sort of string copy, right? It doesn't have any sort of notion of what is the maximum size for this destination buffer. It's just saying, well, we've got some, some XML tag that's coming in and we're gonna copy it to that destination. And, you know, it's based on some special checking for the, you know, size of the thing based on not having a, you know, space or greater than sign, et cetera. But yeah, this function is effectively just a wrapper that is kind of like a special case string copy. And so this is what we mean when we say that people inevitably write wrappers around uh, dangerous functions like mem copy, string copy, etc. They may be doing something special, but at the end of the day, this thing behaves basically like a string copy. So what was the fix? Well, it was proprietary code and there was no patch analysis done by the researchers. And, you know, just the fact that I mentioned at the very beginning, they didn't list a CVE number, so we can't even go back and find whether or not this was fixed without doing a whole bunch of work. So the fix is unknown at this time.